there we go that's better thank you very much Roxanne and uh, I know you often hear Roxanne speaking about giving because of course she's on announcements but um, Ross and Roxanne very much live that they're extremely generous people and they sow a lot of their resources into God's kingdom today welcome great you can be here this is part three in our series all about the call of the major prophets the call of the major prophets I'm standing up here thinking I'm really hot not hot as in look good but as in temperature I might uh, there we go someone has immediately responded to that <laughs> uh, I, I, this, these people that were there was a British guy who used to own the house we used to live in and um, it was middle of summer and he was he, he, he drove in and uh, because he was wanting to look at the house doing some renovation and all sort of stuff we were renting it from him and his wife was British and um, she, she um, she's there in this sporty little black car and she said oh hi I'm the hot pom and then she realized what she said <laughs> I mean temperature she says <laughs> anyway moving right along um, <laughs> You know, you saw all those broken pieces of pottery with scriptures on them as you walked in today, and you might have been thinking, what on earth is that all about? Because um, if, if you weren't here last week, that is. Uh, well, uh, towards the end of the message last week, you know, I mentioned that um, there's been something of some prophetic words, I would go as far to say, that a few people have spoken. And so I got to this passage in Jeremiah. We were looking at Jeremiah last week, 18, 3 through 6. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, what the potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. And I, I mentioned that um, recently we had had a um, few members give a prophetic word, and I'll, I'll give one of them because it kind of sums them up best, I think. It was this. Sometimes a pot plant needs to be replanted in a different or bigger pot for it to reach a new level of health. Some believe that season has come for North Church. So the idea is in 2024, the time has come to change the restrictions of the previous pots. And so as a typical fashion of what the major prophets would do, I had a couple of big clay pots up here in the corner and I smashed one. Um, but that was to illustrate the church. There's a new season for the church. But then I went on um, and uh, added that God also wants to work in the individual's life. And I said this, God has a destiny upon many lives, but that destiny may not be realised until he breaks you to reshape you. Often God works in that way. And so a second pot was broken. And the idea was take two pieces of pot. If you're thinking, I missed out, I wasn't here. The big black bucket on the way to morning tea still has a bunch of broken pieces of pottery. The idea is take two home. Prayerfully consider a scripture from the Bible. It might even be from the major prophets. And write one scripture for yourself, what God is saying to you, and one scripture for the church. And the idea is it's not just a case of doing that exercise, but then put it somewhere. It might be in your office desk. It could be on a mantelpiece at home, coffee table at home. If it's a small one, it could be in your car, centre console. And, um, you know, uh, here's one that I, there's the one that I actually popped up on my desk, the two scriptures the Lord put on my heart. Let me read them to you. Um, Jeremiah 29, 11 was the one for the church. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And the one for myself, again, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So, what do I mean by a piece of pot, if you weren't here last week? Something like this. Just grab one of those out of the bucket. Prayerfully write a scripture on it. Don't mind if you're just visiting today. You can still do that if you want to. Well, today we're looking at the prophet Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel. And uh, in some ways he might be the least familiar for you. Uh, he is a dramatic, colourful prophet. Um, I'm going I'm to start off by getting straight into the book. First three verses, Ezekiel chapter 1, 
and verse 1. In the 13th year, in the fourth month and the fifth day, while I was among the exiles at the river Kiba, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, by the river Kibar in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was upon him. So the previous prophets were prophesying from largely Jerusalem. He's been taken away in exile. He is prophesying from the land of the Babylonians amongst the river system there. And you will remember that old song, 78, won't you? All about that. By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, we wept when we remembered Zion. Remember that one, 78? Huge hit, that song. I can't believe it. I checked it out this week. Number one in several European countries, including the UK, Canada and Australia. Didn't do well in America, but man, huge hit. Huge hit. That song, of course, is all about this period. Ezekiel there in the land of the Babylonians getting revelation amongst the rivers. Um, And uh, it's based on Psalm 137. You read Psalm 137, you'll see the lyrics of the song. Interesting, it's it's basically a Christian chorus, but was a huge hit. Um, We're going to see that uh, in many ways Ezekiel is the most colourful of all the prophets. Some extraordinary visions. Let's have a look at a map here. And uh, we'll see the red one is uh, the river uh, Kibar. It has a couple of different spellings. Um, so he's somewhere around there where you can see the river Kibar, the canal, the red one. That's about where he would have been at the time when he's receiving this prophetic vision. Now, Ezekiel had been in training to be a priest in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, that meant he'd be learning the sacrificial system, how to make sacrifices to the Lord. Um, prayer was all part of that, developing a prayer life, praise. In fact, often the priests would learn uh, musical skills, an instrument, voice, even songwriting. And uh, he would have known how to draw close to God. That's part of the training. But when he was about 25, 26 years of age, he was taken in exile to the Babylonians with about 10,000 other people. The second exile from the southern kingdom in about 597 BC. Now, just think about this for a moment. Ezekiel, we certainly see, is a godly man. He would have been passionate about this opportunity to be a priest. He's in training. He may have felt that all of his dreams of serving as a priest had been broken like clay pieces, smashed. But we find the Lord had a new call for him. Four years later, he's about 30 now, and that was the the age the priests would graduate. That's when they would become, you know, uh, they'd have a ceremony and they would be considered a fully qualified priest. But at 30, instead of being a priest, he was called to be a prophet in the land of the Babylonians. Um, and this is the initial vision he saw, 593 BC. Ezekiel 4, uh, 1, 4 through 11. I looked and I saw a violent storm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The centre of the fire looked like glowing metal. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, Their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings and on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being. On the right side, each had the face of a lion, and on the left, each had the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Extraordinary description, isn't it? I mean, these are just, these are angelic creatures that are just, my goodness, he must have been overwhelmed when he saw these creatures appear. Absolutely overwhelmed. Um, And, uh, well, uh, 
you might be thinking to yourself, can we learn a little bit more about them? They're mentioned, I think, in chapter 10. There's further description of them in chapter 10 of Ezekiel. But to be honest, many scholars believe these are the creatures mentioned in Revelation as well. I'd like to read a bit about them. Let's have a look at Revelation. Revelation 4, 6b. In the centre round the throne were four living creatures. They were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had the face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around it's, and under its wings. Now, I know it's a slightly different description, but you've got to remember, now it's the Apostle John looking at this, not Ezekiel, and God often uses the personalities of the different writers of the Bible. He doesn't dictate to them what to write. He impresses upon them what to write. And so he uses individuals' personalities. And in one sense, he will have... Um, he will have had the overarching... He's the, God is the editor. He makes sure what goes in the Bible is what he wants, but he uses the personalities of the people. But why would God create such extraordinary angelic creatures? Well, we find out in the next few verses. Revelation 4, 8 through 11. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honour. So these majestic angelic beings are created for what? They are around the throne of God constantly worshipping. The 24 elders get their cue when to fall on their knees and throw their crowns at the feet of the throne and worship. Wow. The Bible never gets dull. <laughs> but I want to suggest if these creatures are constantly worshipping around the throne of God, then surely there must be some principles in worship that we can learn from them. Let's see. Can I suggest this, first of all, that we need to be a people like them that worship in God's manifest presence. Number one, worship in God's manifest presence. What do I mean by manifest presence? Well, I'm saying this, that um, God is present everywhere. He is omnipresent. But the fact is, God manifests his presence in a stronger or deeper way at certain times. It's not just us experiencing more of his presence, it's actually he releases a stronger reality of his presence. And sometimes it's in our worship, and I talked a bit about this, it's as we draw close to God in worship and in prayer, he start, he, the, the, the reality of us sensing him becomes stronger, but it's he himself often presences himself in a greater way. And I mentioned um, last week uh, just how it come from the first message actually with Isaiah, how people are gathering a little more now in the church. There's been regular times where we've got together, might be three or four, might be five or six, just gathering, worshipping here in this centre. And some of these times of prayer have been powerful. I said Tuesdays and Thursdays. We're always open by 9.30 on a Tuesday. We don't close until after 9.30 at night. And the same on Thursdays. So those sort of times, just pop in, see what happens, see what God does. Uh, come and join us for prayer and worship. Ezekiel 1.11 says this, They each had two wings spreading out upwards, each wing touching that of the other creature on either side. Now you notice that they were connected with one another, these worshipping creatures. Their wings were touching one another. They may be looking to the Lord in worship, but they're also connected with one another. Can I suggest this? Number two, worship in unity. Worship in unity. Corporate worship, it's wonderful when there is that sense of unity, that common focus on God and good relationship with one another. Ezekiel 111 says this. They each had two wings spreading out upwards, each wing touching that of the, other, uh, of the creature on the other side and each of the two wings covering its body. You got the idea? They're flying, part of their flying, they're using wings, but it also adds that they're actually covering 
their splendour. They're reducing something of their own majesty by kind of covering up. It's as if they're saying, worship Jesus. Worship the one on the throne, not us. Don't look to our glory. No. Can I suggest this? Number three, worship in humility. Worship in humility. Now, this is the opposite to Satan. Satan, likewise, was a a majestic, extraordinary, angelic being. But he came to the point where he wanted everyone to worship him. And there is an account in the book of Ezekiel that many scholars believe is about Satan. Let me read a little bit of it. 28, 16b. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, that refers to heaven, and expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendour. So I threw you to the earth. We unpacked that a little bit more in the uh, Defeating the Dark Side series last term. But let me just mention, you know, Luke 10 and 14, where Jesus is speaking, he starts to renounce the, the city of Tyre, the, the land of Tyre. And this double prophecy in Ezekiel is about the ruler of Tyre, but it's also about the demonic power, Satan, who is behind that rulership. And the prophecy goes on. What I read then is the bit that's about Satan. When Jesus says the words about rebuking um, the future of what's going to happen in Tyre, judgment on Tyre, he immediately then jumps across and says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He links the two prophecies from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1.12 says this, Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. Um, so the, these creatures are spiritual. Their spirit is the, the aspect of them that, that uh, influences what they do. And don't we read in the scriptures, may we be people who are not governed by the flesh, but by the spirit. The flesh means, uh, that's the old King Jimmy uh, term, NIV often says body, but really what it means, it's the soulish part of us and the physical part of us, which is very important. But our spirit comes alive when we're born again. And that's that aspect of our person that should be the main part of us that is steering us. Well, they were led by their spirit. Can I suggest this? Number four, worship in spirit. Worship in spirit. Remember Jesus said in John 4, worship in spirit. He actually says those words, worship in spirit. Ezekiel 1, 13, first bit of the verse. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Um, you know, often fire is used to speak of passion. And can I suggest we as worshippers shouldn't be bored or disengaged, but we should be passionate about worshipping the almighty God. Can I suggest this? Number five, worship with passion. Worship with passion passion second part of verse 13 says this fire moved back and forth among the creatures it was bright and lightning flashed out of it i'll tell you what lightning is bright i don't know if you've ever been in a situation you've had lightning strike very very close to you it, it looks bright in the distance i'll tell you what it's right in front of you it's real bright <laughs> i had an occasion where uh, my wife and I were going out for lunch. We lived in Sydney at the time. Sydney was notorious for summer thunderstorms. I mean, they were dramatic. Um, and anyway, the storm hit as we're sitting in traffic and man, there is just lightning striking all around us. It looked amazing. My goodness, it did. And one of the strikes, thick, sharp, it was like that thick in front of me. Like, you know, it was like, you know, wide, bright, brilliant white light and struck the traffic lights in front of us. Sparks went everywhere, the power went off everywhere. Amazing! Pamela started crying, but I, I was just, I was gobsmacked. Oh, this is awesome, you know? Um, <laughs> light, you know, light reveals reality. Light reveals the truth, doesn't it? You turn on a light in a room, you see what's in there if the room is dark. God is light, it says in 1 John 1, 5. And in him there is no darkness at all. Light reveals reality or the truth. Can I suggest this? Number six, worship in truth. Worship in truth. Our worship should still be governed by the Scriptures. Spirit-led, but governed by the Scriptures. And remember what John said this 
to the Samaritan woman, actually. It's interesting. Um, 4.23, he says, Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. One more point about worship. One fourteen. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. Speed, incredible speed. They're moving as fast as lightning. Um, Energy. And I want to suggest, friends, you know, God's presence is energising. One of, my, one of my churches, we used to have a, a, a Sunday evening uh, revival prayer meeting. So it was worship and prayer. Man, it was passionate. And um, I would come back from that meeting. You know, we'd, I don't know, it was a kind of a, what time did we start at? Seven o'clock? Probably. Anyway, I'd come start driving back home at nine o'clock, mate. I couldn't sleep. No, all hyped up, man. Adrenaline's just flying everywhere, you know. God's presence brings energy. You know, can I suggest this? Number seven, worship with energy. Worship with energy. Well, let's recap on those seven points about worship we learned from the angelic beings. Number one, worship in God's manifest presence. Two, worship in unity. Three, worship in humility. Four, worship in spirit. Five, worship with passion. Six, worship in truth. And seven, worship with energy. We're about to see that Ezekiel is going to see something even more glorious. His eyes are going to go above the creatures. Let's read about it. 125. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault, over their head was what looked like a throne of sapphire and high on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up looked like glowing metal as if full of fire and that from there down he looked like fire like fire itself and brilliant light surrounded him like the appearance of a rainbow and the clouds in a rainy day so was the radiance around him this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the lord and when i saw it i fell face down and i heard the voice of one speaking He sees the throne of the Almighty God. Jesus in all his glory, not Jesus coming as as the human on planet Earth, but Jesus in all of his glory. And as much as he he stood and observed the worshipping angels, when he comes, when he sees the throne of God, he falls upon his knees. He's overwhelmed. The Almighty God. Almighty God has appeared to him. What an incredible privilege. God has come. Revealed himself to that prophet in all of his glory. Friends, one of the things we discover is when one comes into the presence of God, you hear his call. The more overwhelmed with the presence of God, We are the clearer his guidance becomes. Ezekiel 1, 1 and 2. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. So I heard him speaking to me. Perhaps without the Spirit of God entering Ezekiel, giving him the strength to stand. Perhaps he couldn't have been able to stand, to be honest. But we learn a principle here, three principles about the way God works with this great prophet. A, equipped by God's spirit. Equipped by God's spirit. That's what we learn here from Ezekiel. He was equipped by God's spirit. Next few verses, two, three through five. He said, son of man... I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign law says. 
and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Not an easy message to preach. Like Jeremiah, he wasn't necessarily listened to that well. But his responsibility was to preach the message. And that's the second thing. B, sent to speak God's message. Sent to speak God's message. One of the things he had to do was dispel some false hopes. The word was going around with those who had gone into exile that it would be short-lived and they'd be coming back home soon. And of course, he had to prophesy about the ultimate destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And though it won't be a short time, you're going to be there for 70 years. Um, obviously not easy to preach. And of course, he had a prophetic word to the surrounding nations as well. Because some of them in their... They went too far with the way Israel was persecuted, with where the Jews were persecuted. And they fell into judgment because of that. The Babylonians invaded Judah a third time, a final time, in 586 BC, completely destroying Jerusalem, burning the temple, and deporting the rest of the people. 2 Kings 25, you want to read about this? Go to 2 Kings chapter 25, tell you all about it. But you know, he also brought a message of hope. Because he let them know the time will come, you will be re-established as a nation through the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, that there will be a time where you'll become a nation again, you'll turn back to the Lord, wonderful revival as is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 8, and there's also all sorts of wonderful promises about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus' second coming and his first coming. Let's read on. Ezekiel 2, 8 through 10. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like the rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. On both sides were written words of lament and mourning and woe. Going on to chapter 3 and the first three verses. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go, speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Very visual, isn't it? But we learn another principle. Part C, he was nourished by God's word. He was nourished by God's word. Now, I realise some of you might be thinking, oh my goodness, Lee. As interesting as it is, how can we relate these sort of extraordinary phenomena back to our world? Um, does God you know, call people using supernatural experiences today is it still relevant to read this sort of stuff I got saved in 1988 and uh, it's fairly radical salvation mum and dad were not believers in Jesus and seven months thereabouts after I got saved I was at a river, not doing anything spiritual particularly to start with. I was just trying to catch some trout. But it was pretty rubbish. Ross, they just were not on the bike, mate. It's useless. <laughs> Don't know why. <laughs> I thought the conditions were all right. But anyway, nothing happening. Anyway, so I thought, nah, look, you know what? I'm just going to spend some time in prayer. I used to carry a, a pouch of memory verses. Went through a bunch of those with the torchlight because it was evening by this time. And then I started to sing some songs of praise, no one around. And, uh, and the, the river bend had all these little stones, pebbles everywhere. Really quite pretty, actually. And I found myself getting caught up in the singing songs of worship, praying prayers of worship. And a little bit like the Old Testament, you see it a lot there. Threw myself down on the stones. They called it, you know, laying out prostrate. So worshipping God like that. It's very intense, actually, very intense probably on the stones for 
not a huge time, 10 minutes or so, and I looked up. Mate, about five metres away from me, about a metre and a half above the water, there was this pillar of swirling light, a little bit like the colours we see there on the screen. White, red, blue, yellow, swirling in the shape of a pillar. It was probably about three metres high, about two metres wide, and it's just there. I thought an angel was going to appear. I mean, I, I was gobsmacked. What is this? And I just stared at it for, I don't know, five minutes or six, seven minutes, just staring at this thing. What is, you know, in complete wonder and awe. But, you know, only... Um, only 18 months before, I was an atheist. The scientific mind started clicking in. What is this? What is causing this? I mean, it's not the moonlight. How is this? What on earth is going on here? How is this going? I'm thinking of a natural phenomena, you know? And, but when those thoughts came into my mind, suddenly it just vanished. And I realised, oh, it really was supernatural. That was a supernatural thing. I didn't know what it was. I just thought, it must have been of God. I don't understand it. But later, as a Christian, I realised that that is very descriptive of the Shekinah glory of God descending. In fact, I, I watched a documentary about um, the Israelites uh, being led out of the wilderness, you know, and by night it was the glory of God, a pillar of his glory. On the film, when they're trying to you know, recreate it, it looked just like the pillar I saw. One I saw was smaller, but it was exactly, just looked just like it. Fascinating statement. Why has God got to do that? I'm, I've known the Lord for seven months. I'm just a young Christian. About three months after this, by now I'd got into the pattern where I used to finish work at um, every second week on a Friday. They'd knock off at 12 noon. And um, I had got into the pattern where about once a month I would drive into the forest and uh, I just... Um, Sleep in my car, two nights, Friday night, Saturday night. I had my Bible, I'd have a notepad, have my guitar, acoustic guitar, and just sing songs to the Lord, memorise scripture, meditate on passages, pray and worship, you know. Again, by a river. Because I used to fast, I'd just drink from the stream. Again, by a river, I had a question about guidance. And I had a long time of worship and I was bowed down on my knees and I'm asking the Lord a question about guidance and as if he was just standing next to my shoulder, God audibly spoke. It was just a short sentence. I wasn't quite sure. I had, I had to ask a question because I wasn't quite sure what he meant. And I had to ask a question. God speaks again. And of course, God is the master communicator. He had an Australian accent. But this was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And I just threw, having God, having, hearing his audible voice twice, threw myself on the ground. Now I might say, why is God doing this stuff? Well, it was shortly after this, I got that strong impression of call. And that actually, that audible voice was related to this too. You cannot work in a secular job anymore. You do not have time. I have purpose for you. You must serve me full time. I talked with my pastor about this. Didn't tell them the weird stories, of course. They'd think I was a nutter. Um, I talked with um, two of the elders about this. All of them affirmed that we can see that God is calling you to be a missionary, an evangelist, or a pastor. We can see the call of God is clearly upon you. Let's pray into the timing of all of this. I share the story simply to link it back that God actually still does extraordinary supernatural things in the journey of calling people. There'll be others here that have got great testimonies as well. And the three things really that um, God wanted Ezekiel to do, those three things we learnt before, were very similar to what the Lord had said to me as well. You remember the three things? The prophet Ezekiel was a equipped, let's have all three of them up there. 
Remember, the prophet Ezekiel was equipped by God's spirit, sent to speak God's message, nourished by God's word. They were the three things God did in my life as well. Those same three things, the spirit of the Lord was equipping me and gifting me. I was sent to start preaching his message. Invitations started to come. And thirdly, I was always in the word of God to nourish me. Friends, a time like this, I think we need Sue to pray for us all. What do you reckon? (laughs) Thank you, Sue. Father God, we just thank you for your word that we have heard today. And I just speak on on behalf of everybody that we receive your word with gladness. We receive that nourishment. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you remind us of these words today so that we can continue feeding on them during the week, that we can apply them to our life and that we will hear what you have to say, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, because your words are spirit and your words are life to us. And we will not live by the natural bread alone, but we will live by every word that you speak to us so that we can flow in the spirit and not in the flesh, not led by our bodily stuff or our soul stuff, but led by you. Because we want all glory to be yours and we want the earth to see you in us, Jesus' hands and feet. Lord, we're hungry for more of you and we thank you for your presence today. And we allow you to touch us and speak to us and we receive everything. I bless all of our hearts to receive everything that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be upstanding.